James Stockdale was a United States Navy Vice Admiral and Aviator who was ordered, awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions in the Vietnam War, during which he was a prisoner of war for more than seven years. It was his leadership role that earned him that Medal of Honor. And here to share more about his legacy is his son, Taylor Stockdale. Taylor, good morning. Thank you, first of all, for the, the awesome email you sent me last week. Thank you for the time on the phone this past week. And thank you for joining us here on Good Morning San Diego. Thank you so much. Great to be here. You know, I was I was doing the math. You, your your dad was shot down on September 9th, 1965. And just doing the math, you must have been about three years old at that time. And when he got back from captivity, you would have been about 10 years old. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Yeah. So what was it like right. did, as as growing up in, with your mom in that household? I'm sure she talked about your dad all the time. But as you got older, did did you remember him from when you were three? Not really. I mean, I had a couple of very vague memories. Uh, I remember when he was uh, heading out uh, for his cruise, which we thought was going to be a seven or eight month cruise. And uh, my my older brothers had me on the on the hood of the car waving goodbye, and uh, that's about it. So I really didn't have any memories of him uh, before he left. Well, I'm sure your mom spoke of him probably on a daily basis as you were growing up. Do you remember watching him get off that plane when he was repatriated? Oh, vividly. It was 50 years ago, actually. And uh, and uh, yeah, standing on the tarmac of Miramar Air Airfield uh, with my mom and brothers, uh, it was completely surreal. And, and one of the things they had him do because he was the senior ranking officer was to give a speech. So he had to give a speech coming coming off the plane, and uh, I didn't hear a word of it. I remember it was just a complete blur. And then uh, my mom was in a different section, and she came out and hugged him first. And then they allowed um, m uh, myself and my brothers to come out and hug him. And I remember when I hugged him, uh, you know, when he left, he was probably 165 pounds. When he got off that plane, he was probably 115 pounds. And uh, but he still had his naval uniform on. So I remember hugging him and I had had this feeling like as a kid of hugging my dad and having it be this big kind of burly guy. And when I hugged him, it was almost like it was a ghost. There was hardly anybody in the in the uniform when I hugged him. And uh, I remember that was a, made a real impression on me of sort of like, where is he? You know, is he here? Hmm. And uh, but but it was from that point on, it was just a big journey. And getting to know my dad after all those years. Yeah, I was about to say, you, you, you're just getting to know him. Now, it was shortly thereafter that he was uh, awarded the uh, the Medal of Honor. Did you know at right. the time what a big deal that was? You know, it's funny, I, I, it was in 1975, and I didn't uh, I didn't know it at the time uh, when when he uh, told the family. He was very emotional, which which was not like him, so I knew something big was going on. And then we went out to Washington, D.C., and Gerald Ford um, issued him the Medal of Honor. Then I knew it was a huge deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I'm... it was in the White House and, and everything else. So, wow. Um, yeah, it was a big, a very big deal for the family. Now, you ended up going back to Vietnam, and, and did, did you tour the Hanoi Hilton, the prison? I did, yeah. I was there on, on business in Hong Kong, and I, I, I was in touch with the State Department, and I got the GPS coordinates of where he was shot down. So I went over to, to Hanoi first to, uh, you know, take a few days and tour the prison. I had a really amazing tour guide. And then we went down to uh, a, a little village called Tinja, which is about five hours south of Hanoi, four hours, and in the middle of nowhere in, the, in a village. And that's where he was shot down. And I was able to tour for the entire day uh, where, where his plane landed, where he landed. I talked to people who cleaned up his wreckage from his plane. It was an amazing uh, journey. It was only a couple of days, but it, it really had a big impact on me. And you bought a home a very unique souvenir you were telling me. I did, yeah, and I have it right here. Um, Let's see. When I was uh, there in the village toward the late afternoon, I met one of the gentlemen who uh, was cleaning up the wreckage. And a long story short, we were in a very pr uh, primitive scenario in his, in his home, and there was a wood table in the middle of his living room and he said that that was my dad's plane part. That my dad was the only one shot down in this village during the entire war. So uh, I, I looked at the wood and I thought, well, I don't think there was any wood on the uh, on an A4 at the time. <laughs> right. But then he had his sons rip off the cover of the table, and underneath it was this uh, metal uh, kind of fuselage. Yeah, let's see it. Let's see it. Device, and here it is. Oh, and, wow. Uh, 
Yeah, and and you can see a bullet hole right here. Oh yeah, you can see that? Yeah. Wow. So, have you, now, have you ever, have you been able to identify um, through a, 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 an aviation mechanic of what part of the A4 that was? I did. I went I went back to North Island with it, which is where they were at the time. This was in 2003, and they were still repairing A4 jets at the time. And they there's a serial number on there, and they authenticated it as my dad's plane. So wow. that was pretty. That, that is, was pretty uh, rewarding when, once they did that. That's fascinating. Now, you told me something on the phone that resonated with me. You said your dad told you that, I, I, I'm paraphrasing, I'm trying to remember, we, there was so much going on, that that some of his most most peaceful days were spent in the prison. Is that accurate? Something yeah, like that. I mean, it was, it was more about, like, he would say, some of my most fulfilling days were in that prison. That's it. And as and as a as a you know as a boy and as a young man, I didn't really understand that, nor did my brothers. And then when I went da back to the prison and I walked around, and I just pictured him there. You know, he was in solitary confinement for four years, and he was the leader of his men, and he really he really did an amazing job of of getting everyone out and with their heads held high. And uh, and I, it finally kind of resonated with me that, uh, you know, why he would say that. And I came home. And I talked to my dad about it, and he was so relieved that somebody from the family had been there. And then I said, you know, I think I understand why they were, it was so fulfilling at times. It's because, you know, and he said, he said, everything I've done in my life leading up to that challenge, I drew on to get our men through. So every element, I had no idea, every football practice, every every heart exam, every every element of my childhood, everything I did as a naval officer leading up to that moment, uh, I was able to draw on and so that I could get my men, my men out um, in the best way possible. Okay, now I have to ask you, um, while I've got you here, um, I want to let our viewers know about some a guy we talked about, and the POWs all knew, about a sailor named Doug Hegdahl. Doug Hegdahl, right. just in the, I'm going to give you the quick version. There's his picture. Yeah, 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 there he is. He goes, yeah. he, he, he's on a ship off the coast of Vietnam, yeah. goes overboard. Nobody notices. He's in the water for 12 hours, gets picked up by Cambodian fishermen. They turn him over to the North Vietnamese. They beat him up with rifle butts, and they take him uh, ultimately to the Hanoi Hilton. And he, what he did is he played dumb. He acted like he was a complete idiot, yeah. and he ended up falling in favor with his Vietnamese captors, and he ended up basically getting free reign of, of uh, the the the, uh, the prison and the reason I bring this up is uh, and I told you I'm trying to find this man at right. last at last report um, he was the uh, he was a guy he would be 76 now but he rode his bike around Ocean Beach and he kept to himself yeah. so every POW I've ever met knows uh, who Doug Hegdahl is and I asked you if you'd ever heard that name tell them what you told me because I was pretty astonished sure so yeah so he had a photographic memory and he was able to memorize every person's name at the prison camp. So um, his mother fell very ill. And even though the prisoners had a policy that they would accept no early releases, they were all going to go out together. And many of them, including my dad, had offers to leave early and they said no, they were going to stay with their men. They allowed Doug to leave early because he was so young and because he had this photographic memory and he could tell uh, the U.S. Uh, officials who was alive in the prison camps, et cetera. So he came home early. He actually stayed in our home in Coronado for a few months. And um, we had a little apartment down below. And he stayed there. And he was almost like a big brother to me. Um, he would go to my Little League games. He was an umpire at my Little League games. Wow. Uh, he was a great guy. And I would love to see him again as well. Uh, I saw him briefly, I think, at my mother's uh, memorial service. But it was very brief. And I have not seen him since. So I would, I would love to just say thank you to him. He was an amazing person. Yeah, the, the guy. This is the this is one of the greatest stories out of Vietnam, out of yeah. that war that's never been told. Remarkable I mean, story. It, it's just remarkable. Uh, and for our viewers, I mean, we're just scratching the surface. This this story has so many layers to it. And uh, you you said you would help me in uh, in trying to find Doug Hegdell. And I want to put this out to everybody in San Diego, all of our viewers. He would be 76 years old today. He's known to be uh, have kept to himself pretty much. Um, never married, never had kids. 
Um, but the, he's just the man is fascinating, and for you to have known him the way that you did is yeah. just it just intrigues me even more. So I'm going to put this out for our viewers. If you know a guy who rides his bike around, about 76 years old, named Doug, we're trying to find him. Doug Hegdahl, if you can hear my voice, and if you're watching right now, please email me, call the station, um, shoot, call Taylor if you got his number. We just we just oh, want to yeah. I want to meet this. We've got to we've got to meet this guy. So. Boy, Taylor, I, I can't thank you enough for your time and uh, your, uh, your, the time you spent with us on this Sunday morning. I know you're getting ready to retire and move back to Coronado, That's at right. which time I, I'm, I'm looking forward very much to meeting you in person, sir. Thanks a lot. Great. Well, thank you for, for putting so much time into this. We really appreciate it.